Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, this is going to be a super exciting after lunch panel that's going to wake everybody Everyone up. up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought I was going to do a PowerPoint, and I had like an awesome uh, photo of myself to put up there. <laughs> but you guys don't get to see that, although it was really a nice, nice thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I was a Neiman Fellow a few years ago. I highly recommend applying for a Neiman Fellowship because it's like the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Um, I also teach journalism at Yale University. No offense to Harvard, but um, that's where I'm teaching now. And uh, I've covered housing for a long time. And, it, and one of the reasons I like covering housing is that it does intersect so many different parts of people's lives, right? And, and that's our topic today, is how housing intersects with other beats. And it's sort of the, the base of the pyramid of needs, right? I mean, shelter is such a fundamental thing that if you think about it, uh, your house is going to involve issues of social justice and criminal justice and healthcare outcomes and education outcomes and broader economic and financial beats and the environments. Um, we'll talk later. I mean, and, and, and even, look, if you're covering the city council um, and something really boring comes up, like minimum lot size zoning, and that sounds like, oh my god, that's super boring. But really, that's the way that like wealthy neighborhoods keep poor people out. You know? So it's like understanding how that stuff works is super important um, for us. And uh, so we're going to cover all these different things. And, and the panel kind of, these folks hit on lots of these different areas. So it's a chance for us to have a conversation about, OK, how could I find some stories in my beat that are related to all this that might be super interesting? So uh, Dr. Megan Sandell is in the middle. And she's the Associate Director of the Grow Clinic at Boston Medical Center and a Principal Investigator with Children's Health Watch. Mm -hmm and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Boston University School of Medicine and Public Health. So we talk about housing and uh, outcomes for kids and, um, and health care. Yeah. Ingrid Gould-Ellen is the Professor of Urban Planning and Policy at NYU's Graduate School of Public Service. She's also the Faculty Director of the NYU Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. And Kate Walls is Director of Housing Justice at the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. And I think you'll have a lot of interesting stuff to offer. Uh, Kate advocates on behalf of low-income individuals. And so you know, you're know you down there in the trenches fighting for this or that you know social justice stuff. Um, and we can talk about how she's been a counsel in a variety of litigation aimed at preserving public and subsidized housing and enforcing fair housing laws and all kinds of important stuff. So uh, to get started, and also, what time, can I ask, what time are we supposed to stop? 250. All right, so I want to make sure we leave enough time for you guys to, to ask questions. relevant questions, mm -hmm. too. Um, <clears throat> but Kate, let's start with you. And talking about you know, civil liberties, legal issues, education. Or was it like? A lot of feedback. I was wondering, being a radio person. <laughs> is it? I don't think it's because I think it's. I think it's in the it's in the wire maybe. Because unless I I could try. Oh, is that better? Better. Maybe I'm just sort of staticky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try setting this over here. Okay. It, I think it might just be in the cable. Okay, but here, let's, let's do number five. All right. Should I just keep. All right, well, while they wire me up again, we'll get over to Kate. Uh, and she's going to talk about it. So, uh, uh, housing can intersect, like we just said, civil liberties, legal issues, education. From your perspective as a lawyer, um, Talk about some of the most important ways in which you see this happening, how, how housing is important in you know, denying people access to whether it's you know, a community where they'd have more resources or, or a community where they'd be more safe. I think the mistake with housing is we think about it in terms of units, right? Especially with the uh, uh, HUD budget, it's hard not to what we're going to lose that sort of tangible. Um, but what I have found uh, in my 20 years of uh, legal services is place matters. Mm -hmm. 
it really does matter where people are living, um, what housing they have, what that means for them in terms of health and education uh, and community safety uh, and access to transit and to jobs. And when there's a disconnect, um, things can go terribly wrong. Uh, I'll give you one recent example. Um, I'm counsel to the residents in East Chicago, Indiana. You've heard this story. This is where public housing was sited on an old lead smelt plant in the 60s. And they knew it when they sited it there. And the NAACP protested and said, you can't site it there. And they said, and it's in the record, this is where black and brown people live. And they did. And they continued to redevelop the site and lease it to thousands of families over the years. In fact, they added to the site in 1996, even after strict environmental review was in place. In 2011, they found that the lead levels in the soil were 228 times the, the uh, measurable, acceptable level under the EPA standards at the time. More than 40% of the children uh, in 2009 at the same time had elevated blood lead levels. But they never told the family what they were living in. And they never offered them housing relocation assistance. And in fact, we have clients who had their kids tested for lead, as you do when you have an, uh, an infant, right, and toddler, that they do the blood level testing if you're in an older home, for example. And they would test uh, with an elevated blood lead level. They would go back to the housing authority and say, something's wrong with the housing. You have to help me. And they said, it's probably lead paint. You should paint it over. So my client did. She painted her unit over. A year later, another child in the home uh, tested with an elevated blood lead level. She went back to them, and she said, it's not the paint. It's something else. And they said, if you don't like it, you should move. Uh, so she did. Um, this didn't actually come out in full force until uh, late 2016, where finally they admitted that, this is, that they hadn't told the families. And they quickly issued vouchers and, in effect, just said, get out. Just get out. Just get out as quickly as possible. Here's your voucher. We don't care where you go. So we, as legal aid lawyers, with a team of environmental law experts and health experts, uh, said, no, you, if you're going to move these families, place matters. You have to do this right. You cannot <laughs> recreate what you've done. Um, and simply move them out. Because if you know East Chicago, it's one of the most heavily industrialized cities in the world. Uh, it's sort of shocking to look at that there's these huge refineries, and then there's just a little set of single family homes. So, and we knew the boundaries of this super fine site, which the public housing complex was contained within, were well beyond the, the housing, the public housing itself. And so we filed a lawsuit and insisted that they had to do a risk assessment. They have to evaluate where families are moving to ensure that next set of housing as to water and lead and soil is safe. And they have to try to move them to communities where there will be long-term medical support, long-term educational support for these families. You know, this is as dire as Flint uh, in, in terms of the disaster that it's caused. But the, the sort of indifference to where they put the housing from the beginning and the fact that it continued, even as our civil rights laws improved, our environmental laws improved, is stunning. And a quick follow-up to that. So, and I think this is a nice segue into, all right, so that was a horrible place to be. You want to, you know, so people, whether it's an organized effort to move a lot of people into a better place or it's just a family trying to get themselves into a better neighborhood with better access to education and stuff. You know, I mentioned minimum lot size zoning as, as a reason that you can't build 50 condos on top of each other, that it'd be cheaper and you could make them affordable. And that's, you know, so you can't have even middle income people in some neighborhoods and you can't do that. Are there two or three sort of areas for reporters to be looking at that create obstacles for people to get into a better neighborhood? And what keeps out? Is it, is, it, is it resistance to Section 8 stuff, or is it 
other, I mean, what, what keeps people out of getting into better neighborhoods? So Lolly and I, we're talking about this, Lolly's from the Tribune, and she's one of my favorite reporters at the Trib. Um, and, and definitely issues in terms of NIMBYism and communities being really resistant to affordable housing, be it Section 8 voucher holders or other site-based affordable housing. Um, and that is a huge obstacle. And I think what we were talking about, it's a challenge from a reporting perspective of, you know, do you report that there's going to be this new affordable housing development in a predominantly white, high opportunity community? Or are you potentially setting up a community to incite and, and start to oppose it? And we had that in a case recently in the village of Tinley Park where small you know, beat reporters said there's going to be a family affordable housing development built in the downtown and within 48 hours, a concerned citizens of Tinley Park was created. Um, and you know, very, very awful things said, lots of stereotypes about who voucher holders were, that they were not entitled to be in this community, that it should be in all of the surrounding predominantly African American communities. I don't fault the reporter, but I think it's, there's this question about sort of what you as a reporter set in motion. On the other hand, do you have an opportunity to really dig deep, which I've seen our local NPR affiliate, Miles Bryan at WBZ, like really dug into a community that was resistant to keeping an affordable housing development. He got an interview with the mayor. He got interviews with the city council members. He got interviews with the churches. He did deep human interest stories on the residents who were there and, and really sort of cut away at all the stereotypes. So there's a great opportunity there to, to, to have a deeply investigative piece that brings some humanity to the issue in terms of the people who are using the affordable housing. I think that last thing you said is super interesting too, that like when you can take, uh, when you can humanize a group of people that are seen as like the other mm -hmm. and make them the us by allowing people to connect to the folks who are in the affordable housing. And during my Neiman Fellowship, we had this like super amazingly smart Harvard researcher Naji, I think was her last name, and she talks about like red neurons and blue neurons in the mm -hmm. brain and how like mm -hmm. when, you know, thousands of years ago when we'd approach the watering hole and we'd have to decide very quickly, is it us or them? Is it my tribe or a different tribe? And if you think it's the other, you might have to fight them and then so you can be very mean and, mm -hmm. you know, but, but if it's, if you can relate to them, then like the, those are the red neurons. Then the blue neurons light up in your head if it's part of us. And once you make somebody part of us, Empathy goes way up, and all these other things. So, as journalists, if you're, you know, not like we're activists, but if the goal is to try to facilitate communities functioning better, and that involves, you know, good access for all kinds of folks, I mean, like, you know, I think that sounds like a super important thing. And it just, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to jump in on this point mm -hmm. that I that I also think that that um, for reporters to understand that there's often research on these topics, and there's often research that actually yeah. dispels the myth and dispels the sort of the, the misconceptions and the stereotypes that people have. So we did um, research at NYU, basically. You know, there's, there is a lot of uh, fear about um, voucher holders coming into communities and reducing property values and increasing crime. And, and actually, I will point to one, um, yeah. one news story, yeah. right, in um, the uh, Atlantic um, that Hannah Rosen wrote about 10 years ago now, I think, called, uh, I think it was American Murder Mystery. American mm -hmm. Murder Mystery, yeah. and, um, and she basically took, she spoke to a researcher in, in Memphis and found um, that there were some maps. And she basically, that, and, th and this was, you know, I mean, I blame the researcher, mm. too, that just, it was just basically showed a correlation between uh, a map that in the neighborhoods where there were a lot of voucher holders, there was also a lot of crime. And that that researcher actually jumped to a causal conclusion that, okay, that means that voucher holders cause crime. Well, you know, it turns out that no, um, actually voucher holders, who are the landlords that are most excited to and eager to house voucher holders? It's the landlords who are living in neighborhoods that are going through decline and maybe seeing increases in crime. And so we were able to, honestly, it really wasn't like rocket science, but just sort of look over time and do a, causal study, and we showed that actually, no, it's sort of the causal error goes in the other direction. When crime rises, voucher use tends to increase. But, but an increase in voucher use 
doesn't actually increase crime. And so it can just sort of, to put some facts out there to basically this, you know, to, to challenge the, um, and again, there may be um, implicit or explicit racism that's really driving this, but let's at least sort of get the, the you know, poke holes and sort of the claims that are being made to, to defend this this kind of defensive behavior and, and exclusionary zoning. That's super important too, right? Yeah. Because yeah, there's the, the NIMBY story is yeah. such an old story and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, backing it up with, you know, human examples yeah. of real people along with research that shows like there is absolutely no reason to be resisting yeah. this in this community. Yeah, that's super interesting. All right, Megan, uh, talking about healthcare and, and outcomes, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's some sort of a implicit understanding that where you live has something to do with your health, but uh, you argue that pe people tend to not understand how deep that goes and how serious an issue it is. Can, can you talk about, I mean, just how big a deal this is? Yeah. So thank you so much. And I just want to thank the, the Neiman Foundation and MacArthur for, for organizing it. Um, many of you introduced yourselves and said that you were on the housing beat. And I'm just going to tell you you're not. You're on the health beat at all of your um, different organizations. Because I will argue there is no greater predictor of health than where you live. And, and to an extent housing policy and other drivers are the thing that is the most important thing that drives what is available to families and how to think about that. And so um, I uh, thank you for the question, Chris, because I think that while it's not new to connect home and health, I think that the dimensions of how that happens can be pretty broad, right? So I tend to think about it as like the four dimensions or the four walls um, is around kind of quality, right? Um, and we connect quality and, and housing pretty well. You know, certainly lead is, is one area. Um, I often will talk a lot about asthma as something also that we connect with around pests or mold or things like that. I think that we sometimes miss that there is a lot of research around the negative qualities of housing and how they make you sick. There also are really important positive qualities about housing that can promote health, things like light and things like fresh air um, and uh, access to green space and things like that that become really important. So that it's really important, I think, when you balance it, not to just talk about negative quality, but to talk about positive quality. Um, I also will talk about stability, right? And I think that we talk about homelessness a lot, but what I say is homelessness is part of the iceberg you can see. There's a lot of iceberg below the surface. And so when uh, in our research at Children's Health Watch, which is a a research policy network. It's based out of Boston Medical Center, but we actually collect data in five cities. We collect it in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, Little Rock, and Minneapolis, and really focused on how hardships, common hardships like hunger, unstable housing, problems keeping the heat or the lights on, impact the health and development of young children. And we specifically focus on families with young children because that's when you're growing the brain you need for the rest of your life. And those hardships don't often enter into the conversation of that brain science, and yet we know they can be incredible predictors. And so in our research, kids who move two or more times in a year look like homeless kids in terms of their outcomes. And in, in fact, as we think about kind of that stability argument, affordability comes in that. Because I'll tell you, if a family endorses that they're behind on rent in the past year, they look like homeless kids too. Right? So the, the extent to which we think about these impacts of stability and affordability become really important. And so that I think that while we cover a lot of the, the awfulness that, that homelessness is, to me, we don't often talk enough about the prevention. Right? The how do you kind of get into that family that's in the pipeline to homelessness and think about those solutions? Um, the last one is location, and I think Kate spoke really eloquently about location. Certainly, Ingrid has amazing research about location. And I think that, that that becomes really important because so often location is not a choice, right? And so as we think about things, we, we universally blame kind of families for choosing kind of where they live and, and how bad it may be. And yet that really may not have been a, been a choice altogether. Um, uh, I'll have to thank Chris. I don't think uh, Hubert, he's not here anymore. So I coined a phrase a, a couple years ago called home is a vaccine. It keeps you healthy now and in the future. And that is really where like a stable, decent, affordable home is, is really important in a good neighborhood is really part of that, that home vaccine. Um, that is kind of tied to some research we published over 10 years ago with Children's Health Watch where we looked at families that were food insecure. So they already had a threat to their health. And we looked at those families that were receiving a, uh, some form of a, of a subsidy for their housing 
versus those that were eligible and not getting it, right? And when you look at those food insecure families, the, the families that were eligible but not receiving a, a subsidy of form, uh, they were twofold more likely to have a kid underweight than the similar families that were receiving that type of, of home subsidy. And so when we think about that, right, that was the resiliency, the immunity that that home subsidy gave to that family to not have that adverse effect playing out on the body of their kid, right? And so as we think about this kind of the multiple benefits that home has, I think that we have to really dig deeper into those dimensions. Well, and right now, too, at a time when we're talking about at least in the current budget that is not going to get passed, but, mm -hmm. you know, if we're talking about slashing social programs and other things, mm -hmm. to have research-based examples of like, okay, what happens when a yeah. family loses their housing voucher or their food um, subsidies, I mean, you know, yeah. like you got to, you're twice as likely to, to have underweight kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because I think oftentimes this gets talked about in Washington is like, oh, we're just trimming the red tape and just, mm -hmm. but it's like, well, no, when you can give real examples like that, it's like, this is America and people yeah. are malnourished. I think sometimes where I say, um, so I'm a pediatrician, right? I treat patients. I love telling stories, right? Patients share their lives with me. It's one of the biggest privileges about being a doctor. Where I think sometimes the coverage can sometimes um, uh, not go deep enough is that, right, I understand you all want a, a, a story as your hook, right? That's where you're going to lead you with and, and things like that. And so I'll tell you a story that I think is really good, right? So I work at something called the Grow Clinic, which is for kids with failure to thrive at Boston Medical Center. So these are kids that are like an inch off of the growth curve, right? These are kids that in any other country would be considered malnourished by the World Health Organization. Those kids live in the city of Boston. They come to Boston Medical Center. We try desperately to get them back on the growth curve because if they're not growing their bodies at this time period, they're not growing their brains, right? And so I had a kid that I was treating who was two years old. He hadn't outgrown his 12-month-old clothes yet, and I was desperate to get this kid to grow, right? I'm throwing shakes at this kid and medicines, and I'm trying desperately to get this kid to grow. I'm referring him to GI specialists to do scopes, thousands and thousands of healthcare dollars. And then all of a sudden, the kid started growing, right? What happened to that family? They got off a waiting list, right? They got an affordable apartment. And what I say is, that is not stocked at the pharmacy of my hospital, right? I have trouble right now writing that prescription, and yet that was what they needed to, to get to grow. Now, you may say, that's a great story. Done, right? But the problem with that story is if you end the story there, you have someone, and, and Chris Kramer referred to this as a, the frameworks report that I really encourage you to read, is that inherent in that story then is a little bit of blame to the family of why didn't they get out of that situation? Why didn't they get to a, an affordable housing? Like if you don't talk about the system that the family was in and that the system that made it, that where she sat on the waiting list for two years, which is actually pretty short, two right? Years. <laughs> which is short. Or, or you could talk about, you know, honestly talk about the landlord who housed her. So not just the family, but talk about the landlord that was waiting for the, the, the tax credit and had to braid 20 different forms of tax credits to build the unit that she got off the waiting list for. Like you have to be able to not just, because I think when we just lead with the family that's sick with the hardships, I think we reinforce a frame that does not help us build our constituency. I think we have to talk about the system. And then I also think we have to talk about the solutions. We have great solutions to this problem. We just underdose them. I'm going to shamelessly plug an op-ed that I uh, published today in Stat News where I wrote about what the prescription for HUD was for Dr. Carson, right? And it's all about this idea of dose, right? People say it doesn't work. It is severely underdosed. And so I really encourage you that when you do it, look around the corner. Lead with that family story. We have plenty of them among us, right? But then go to the system and then go to the solution so it feels solvable. And that way, I think you get a better hook in terms of what we can really do. And Megan referenced uh, some of Ingrid, some of your mm -hmm. research. Can, can you talk about the work you've done on the effects of exposure to violence? I mean, if kids live in neighborhoods where that's a bigger problem, what, what sorts of impacts mm -hmm. does housing in that sense have on, uh, on young people? Yeah, so I mean, a, a number of, I think on almost every panel now, we, we've uh, talked about the recent Raj Chetty and yep. Nate Hendren and, and Larry Katz's work, which is really important work um, that 
that, and there's, there's actually really a, a growing um, mountain of evidence showing how much neighborhood matters. Um, that's um, probably the most kind of like, you know, scientifically rigorous um, evidence that we have to date showing that um, neighborhood really matters and it dramatically shapes the long-term outcomes of children and, and, uh, and in particular, I mean, it increases um, earnings as a young, if, if you, uh, for the kids who were, um, got a voucher that, um, that was uh, in, to move to a low poverty neighborhood, their earnings as a young adult increased by 30%. They translated that to a $300,000 increase in lifetime earnings. But this is a huge effect, right? enormous effect. Um, but what that study is missing, and what most of the research on neighborhood effects is missing, is like, well, what is it about the neighborhood? You know, we can't, and so, you know, what we basically have is sort of the treatment there is like move to a low poverty neighborhood, right? Well, we can't, we can't increase, you know, reduce the poverty rate of every neighborhood in, in America, right? I mean, we just, and so the question is, what we really want to know from a policy perspective is, what is it about a neighborhood that, that really makes a difference to a child's life? And so what we've been doing is um, looking at um, one, we've been doing work on schools, but we've been doing one feature of neighborhoods that we think really, hypothesized really matter was, was levels of violence. And so what we were able to do, and not to get all geeky, but um, is sort of a quasi, what's called sort of a quasi-experimental study of the impact of exposure to violence on kids' educational outcomes. And we showed that kids, that a child that's living on a, a block face, basically like one street segment, where a violent crime occurs the week before a standardized test, ends up doing, well, perform worse on that test than the same kid who's like three blocks away, right, st and living on a similarly violent block, but where a violent crime occur occurs the week after the test. So these are sort of comparable kids. But the, it's only the kid that had where the violent crime occurred the week before the test that really saw that hit. And, and really, tragically, it's not just a hit that then that kid recovers from. Well, we find that this actually persists over time, that it compounds over time the more violent uh, crimes that a, a child is exposed to. And it ends up really explaining, um, we found sort of a significant share of the racial disparity in, in test scores. In, I mean, we were doing this in New York City, but I, I don't see any reason that this wouldn't generalize mm. to other cities as well. So I think that sort of gives us some sense of sort of a window into the black box of what, like I said, we have lots of evidence now that, that where you live yeah. matters, right? But the question is sort of what is it about, and there are lots of things, but I think it does suggest that that um, violence is, is, a, is a big part of the story. Yeah, and this idea of crossing beats, you know, if people here, I don't know what everybody's working on, but you know, if, if you cover criminal justice or you're interested in it, I mean, this is a, editors are always looking for new angles on stuff, yes. right? So, I mean, this is a good angle on the criminal justice beat, right? That's right. Not to mention the fact that housing, we've also found that housing disinvestment actually increases um, violent crime yeah. as well. So, that sort of is a cyclical. Uh, and Kate, on the criminal justice beat, again, can, can you talk about uh, how recidivism is related to housing, how you've done research and, and know about research there? We've, uh, we've done work on the issue of, of reentry of individuals who've had contact with the criminal justice system. Um, for most of the federally subsidized housing programs, um, they have been, um, really since the 90s, fairly unwelcome to an individual with a criminal record. And up until very recently, with some big shifts in the Obama administration, they were even denying admission on the basis of an arrest, not a conviction. Um, and while there are only a few uh, statutory mandatory exclusions for lifetime sex offender, um, member, persons on the lifetime sex offender registry or sale or distribution of methamphetamines in subsidized housing, what was happening from our research, we did a state report and a federal report, is they were housing authorities, other federally subsidized housing providers were saying, we have a 100 year look back on any crime whatsoever, arrest, misdemeanor, or felony. You know, so just basically, <coughs> if you've ever had contact with the criminal justice system, you shouldn't bother to apply. Mm -hmm. And there's clear racial disparities, obviously, then in terms of um, these types of policies and practices. So we were able to achieve some progress under the Obama administration identifying that 
you cannot use a arrest as a basis to deny admission, and as well that um, this could constitute uh, discrimination in violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act if you have these types of blanket policies and you're not actually looking at the person as an individual and evaluating if they continue to be a threat um, to other residents at the property, if they can be a good tenant, if they have evidence of rehabilitation. But I think really where this story gets interesting for you as reporters is this is about family reunification in so many cases. These, what we call one-strike policies, have split families apart all over the country. And where people have even removed you know, minor children, 13 and 14-year-old boys, from their leases, and they have been put on the bar list, and they cannot re-enter the premises, even for Christmas. And so they are setting that child permanently on a path um, that's probably not going to end well. And so the, what's been really interesting about doing this work is housing providers have started to engage on this. I think they recognize this problem. Um, I don't know if Aaron's still here. From a couple of standpoints, in terms of even if they're not technically on their lease, they are often, oh, you are here. Yeah. They're in the community. They're, and, and we have this at Grove Park, at the Polo Development Grove Park. They are in the community. And part of these reunification strategies that New York has done with a pilot, Chicago is doing with a pilot, there are pilots elsewhere, is reunifying the family. If they can work with a social service provider, if the family's on board, sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes the families have to really be convinced that this isn't some sort of trick because it was a, such a harsh penalty. Somebody got arrested, family got a notice of eviction, they had to remove the kid from the lease or they were all going to lose their housing, right? Can't even come back for Christmas. So it's a hard sell to a family where you've told them any crime and you lose your housing that we've got this new program and your son can come back. But the, but the New York pilot, and you may know a lot more, is actually showed that once they were reunified, they, they were not convicted of uh, a criminal offense again, and they were meaningful contributors to their family mm -hmm. in terms of caring for elderly parents, providing child care assistance. Um, so these are important programs. And, and from a community violence perspective, I just see this as a legal aid attorney working in, in Woodlawn, what Paula has done is with their social service program, it is opened up to all residents in the Woodlawn community. It's intentional in that way because we know that they're couch surfing. We know that they are there. And it's better to engage them and potentially find a way to bring them home and to give them a new opportunity. Yeah, something I'm struck by by listening to all this is, you know, um, we were saying, well, look, if you're on other beats, these are ways that you can cover housing. But if your beat is housing, you know, a trick, a good trick for being a reporter, I've always found it's like, okay, you'll be told, well, your beat is to cover business. And it's like, oh, geez, okay, that sounds kind of boring. But mm -hmm. then it's like, wait a minute, okay, but business involves money, and money is like oxygen, and oxygen in, in, in everything we do, right? So, okay, I want to go to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and do stories about economic development there, or some cool, new, exciting drug treatment that's coming out of a biotech company. And it's like, you know, as reporters, it's sort of our job, if our editor's being boring and saying like, well, you know, okay, you're the housing reporter, so every time the home builders come out with their new numbers, you got to do a story about the new numbers. It's like, here's, with this stuff, you can be like, nah, yeah, okay, fine, I'll do it. But like, um, I got five other really awesome ideas that are way more important than that. You know, and it's like, it just makes me think that like, in some of these beats that you can feel trapped in sometimes, there's just, it can be so much richer if, you know, you, you go more broadly. Uh, all right, Megan, I am told that Megan wants to talk about uh, the ACA, the healthcare debate, how it's drowning out issues with housing and uh, how we should be dealing with that. Well, I do think, I, I think Chris, you make a good point in some ways. Um, making friends with other beat reporters to cross cover things, I think, is a really um, nice strategy to, to think about that. And I do think right now, um, in the current environment, we're talking a lot about ACA repeal and things like that and how crushing the 
the cost to healthcare is. One of the things that people may not realize is, is that there's a housing story in that, right? So 1% so of people in the healthcare system use 25% of the dollar, right? So when we're trying to do, and Sean mentioned this last night, bending the cost curve on that, there's a housing first story there because to an extent, you know, Boston Medical Center, the hospital I work at, a quarter of the people that are in our um, hospital beds at any given night are homeless, right? So when we're bending the cost curve, we're trying to think about it, guess what we're thinking about? We're thinking about entering into partnerships with housers because I'll be honest, like the joke is, is Medicaid doesn't pay for housing. Oh yes, it does. It pays for four East yeah. and it pays for ER beds, right? We pay for it all the time. We'll say, oh, we, we don't pay for housing for criminals. Yes, you do. You put them back in prison. Like, yeah. like you pay for it and you pay for it and it's so expensive. So to an extent, being able to kind of unpack like the argument. So what I'll say sometimes in medicine, we talk about the symptom and the disease, right? So the symptom may be the cough. The disease is the pneumonia. I can cover up the cost, the cough with syrups, right? I can try and make your cough kind of get a little bit better. Um, but until I give you the antibiotic, right, that pneumonia is not going to go away. And I feel like that's where we end up a little bit in the healthcare system. You can change the delivery system reform as much as you want, but if you're discharging someone to the street, it is not surprising that a third of those people bounce back in 30 days. And that's where we have to kind of try and and get to that hidden solution side, right? We don't want people to be recidivist. Why aren't we letting them be reunified with their families that will keep them out of prison? That unintended consequence piece, I think is a really interesting angle so that I wish that there was more kind of um, uh, talking about, about that promise because I think that that's a really important angle. So I'd like to take a couple minutes now. I mean, you know, when I go to a housing or a reporting conference, or any kind of conference, if I can come away with like two, three good story ideas at the end of it, like, oh yeah, I totally want to go dive into this. Um, so I want to make sure we leave enough time for you to ask some questions and be as specific as you want. You know, well, in my city, which is X, here's what's happening. What do you guys think about this? Um, ask us some questions that can be super micro, you know, that, that can help you with a story you're working on or come up with a good story idea, and we can come back and talk about more stuff. But does anybody have a, a question that they want to say? And do we have a mic? for folks to use to ask questions, or should they just shout them out? Yeah. Shout them out, okay. Go ahead. Um, oh, if you want to say your name and where you're from and the news outlet and stuff, do it. Yeah, uh, I'm Elliot News from the Oregonian in Portland. Uh, I'm, I was curious about um, <clears throat> like access to jobs mm -hmm. and to what extent that, um, to what extent that can affect outcomes um, if that's been researched. Do you mean to what extent housing affects access to jobs? I, I mean, yeah, in terms of housing yeah. and uh, location yeah. and so access it, to jobs. It, you know, it's interesting. When, um, when economists first started studying the impacts of neighborhoods, they really thought it was all about access to jobs. So um, there's actually been, um, you know, there, there's not that as much evidence, I will be honest, that, that access to jobs really matters. What um, we, and it doesn't say it doesn't matter, yeah. but, um, but what there is much stronger evidence, right, about the health impacts. Yeah. There's much stronger impacts about the um, educational impacts. And there's much stronger impacts that what really matters is the, the resources in the community where you grew up on sort of how that shapes your, your long-term earnings trajectory. But, um, but it doesn't seem like, we don't have as much evidence, and I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but we don't have as much evidence that being living in a neighborhood where you're close to jobs <laughs> matters. So for instance, in the Moving to Opportunity Program research, right? Um, we actually saw very little, um, what mattered for the adults that moved, so the kids saw these big impacts later in life. The adults, right, they saw significant health impacts, right? They felt better, they felt safer, right? There was mental health, physical health, um, but there actually was, there was no impact on their um, employment or, or earnings. Although when they, I will, yeah, I will just jump in. So yeah. one of the things that I think is amazing, so I'm a pediatrician, obviously I'm gonna hammer ha housing and health together all the time. One of the things that's interesting is, as a pediatrician, I've also looked at some of the educational stuff, and the thing that I don't understand is why the churn in schools, right? You heard um, uh, Chris Kremeyer talk about 40% of the kids churning in a year. Yeah. 
The other thing is chronic absenteeism, yeah, those right? Are huge. 50% of San Francisco yeah. schools have a, a chronic absenteeism problem. So I don't, I don't care. You can do the best educational thing you want to do. If kids aren't showing up or staying long enough in that school, you will not be successful. And one of the things that I've, when I like go around and talk around the country, talking to like the chambers of commerce, like they care about job churn, right? They, they care about workforce housing because they know how much it costs them to hire, to fire, and to train somebody. And so it's not really answering your question about access, but I do think there is a jobs and housing story. And I'll argue if you don't get housing first right, your jobs programs won't be as, as successful. You won't be able to be as, 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 you won't achieve what you want. And certainly geographically, I mean, you know, living in rural America, there's no jobs, that's why everybody's leaving and they're going to cities. I mean, there's a whole sort of migrational, mm -hmm. you know, people move to where the jobs are and labor mobility, and that's why that's such a big issue and stuff, yeah. too. But. I have a follow-up to that. Yeah. So are you saying that there has been research on the, like, place and, like, relative to jobs, and it just doesn't show, like, any sort of impact, or that there just hasn't been a lot of research done? Um, so I'm saying that you know, it, it's, it's a little complicated, and so I'm probably saying that there hasn't been, the studies that we have of neighborhoods really test the impact of poverty rates, right? That's not about job access, so I should clarify. So, so it's not, we haven't kind of, we don't have really strong experimental evidence that says well, what happens if you move a family closer to jobs, right? Because we didn't quite do that, right? The evidence that we do have suggests that what matters about neighborhoods to sh in shaping people's long-term outcomes is, is less, it does seem to be less about proximity to jobs than it is about the schools, than it is about the, the violence level, than it is about the, um, you know, the sort of the, the broader resources in the, in the community. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. and it's not it's not obviously like you know if you live in a in a in a region where there aren't jobs, it's a question of sort of within a market. Right. From this if you're neighborhood living, to that neighborhood. In this neighborhood, it doesn't yeah. seem like that makes as it's it's not as life changing and transformative for families as moving to a, a less violent neighborhood, right. as moving to a neighborhood where the schools are are better and don't have this sort of chronic. Right. Like if you're a trucker and you move to the oil sands belt, you're going to have a lot more work, you know. But here, if you don't have the skills to get a really good job and you live in neighborhood X, but you move to more affluent neighborhood Y, you're not. This is what you're saying, right? You're not necessarily going to yeah. be getting a better job. Mm -hmm. well, what about conversely moving away from the job? Yeah. So there's a lot of evidence around kind of. Um, uh, if you have higher commute times, you typically are unhealthier, right? So the longer your commute time, the worse off that is. Um, I do think, this is where it's hard. I think there is in medicine something called marker versus mechanism, right? So I can tell you that wearing sunscreen is a marker for skin cancer, right? Doesn't intuitively make sense, right? Until you say, oh no, wearing sunscreen is a marker for sunlight exposure, which is the thing that is the mechanism that causes skin cancer. So as um, Ingrid alluded to, sometimes you can do really sophisticated, nice research to try and unlock that so that you can get closer to the causality of what you want. But there is a real danger to slapping two maps on top of each other and saying they're associated because you could start talking about a marker, right? What she alluded to was the fact that, oh, landlord, in places that have more crime, they have a harder time attracting certain people, so they're more likely to accept a Section 8 voucher, and therefore, that's why you see that association. It's more the marker of the crime first, Section 8 second, than it is that Section 8 causes the crime, right? And so that's where I think it gets a little bit hard. Like, people were saying um, in Charlotte, they put in bus lines in certain types of neighborhoods. They saw the body mass index go down. And everyone's like, that's crazy. But it was like, oh no, yeah, people are actually walking to the bus stop. They're home earlier. They're less stressed out. And they're cooking healthier foods, right? And so that's where I think it's, it's peeling back that onion of like what's marker, what's mechanism as much as possible. But sometimes we don't have the evidence to answer it. We just know that there's an association. And then we give you, unfortunately, the researchy answer, which is we're not sure, um, which can be harder to tell that story in the in it. But I encourage you like not to go to the simple answer, because oftentimes that can confuse the situation. OK. Um, a lot of these discussions often turn to 
um, what's happening okay. to you. Can you say who you Sorry, are? Sorry, I'm Simon person? Montague with the Christian Science Monitor. And I, I'm a na I do national, so I don't really, mm. I'm basically about everybody doing anything about Boston. So I was going to say, we, we, you know, we hear about New York, Chicago, Boston. A lot of the examples from these places, nothing wrong with that. I was just going to ask, are there um, other cities, other urban environments where, where these issues play out differently simply because of, I mean, I don't mean just small towns, because small towns mm. are different environments, but the, 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 some of this is that the, 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 the type of the, there's a particular quality to those cities based on the history trajectory and size and industrialization. I'm wondering, what are we seeing in, in sort of newer parts of this country in terms of urban policy and housing and, and some of these issues you're concerned about? Are they making the same mistakes? Are they, are they making new mistakes? You know, are, are there stories that we're not, again, I, mean, I, I, I have a sort of luxury that I, I don't have to just do my local area. Yeah. I, could, I could do stories anyway in theory. Um, but have to find a story. No, so, I, is there a story so that I, I could be doing? I actually argue, in some ways, the coasts aren't doing this as well as the Midwest. Just to give a, okay. a shout out to, um, uh, there's someone from the Columbus Dispatch. So, I will call out Columbus as actually an amazing city that's doing nationwide children's hospitals. Adopted the Southern Orchards neighborhood, which right abuts to it. Put six million dollars into that neighborhood, almost treating like the neighborhood like the patient. Right, 4,400 people, really putting heavy housing, they did, and what's interesting is it's a Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families initiative where they did housing first. In some ways, it's taking the lesson from the chronic homelessness world where you do housing first and then you bring in all the services. They did huge stabilization in that neighborhood, right, where they bought homes, renovated them, sold them to people that worked at the hospital to increase home ownership, um, did uh, lie tech deals where they're now putting the job training center on site in the housing development, and then now we're bringing in the school-based health centers in the schools and trying to do school initiatives. Because what they were, when they tried to do the school initiatives in the initial part, they found that, yeah, 30% of the kids were churning in a year. So I actually, I will argue that sometimes the cities have very different issues, but I actually think some of the Midwestern cities are doing this really, really well. And my take on this is that I think that health systems have a role in community development. That's another positive angle to bring into this of a new solution, new way to think about this. And, um, and I think there are a lot of, every state I could probably name something. Oregon has been doing this. Others that have been really good. Interesting. Yeah. Hi, my name is Camille. I'm with El Diario in New York City. And right now I'm doing some research about this story about tenants suing their landlords for negligence. And I'm focusing on like suits with multiple uh, tenants, or in some, in some cases, buildings. Um, when I talk to the lawyers, what they tell me is that the the courts are, are you know, most of the the parts are dedicated to uh, suits brought by landlords instead of the tenants themselves. And I'm wondering, is there a solution there, or how how? Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about solutions, not just like because uh, part of what I'm trying to do is I cover the immigrant community. Most of them maybe don't know how to navigate this, so I want right. to show them that they they do have rights and they can go to court, but then when I go to the court, I see this problem. So I also want to talk about what you said, the, the story, but also the system. Yeah. So can you talk more about that? Is that something that happens in New York or does it happen all over? And so is it tenants suing their landlord or is it Tenants being brought to eviction court. Ten, I'm focusing on tenants suing, suing their, their landlords because yeah. they're, they're mostly rent stabilized buildings right. and they're being basically neglected right. so they can get out and they can put the apartment in market. <coughs> yeah. It, it, there's a, I mean, part of it is that low income tenants in this country are for the most part represented by legal aid programs. And if you looked at the budget, they, they're zeroing out the Legal Service Corporation. They provide the front line legal services, work non-LSC, yeah. of individual tenant representation, and, of, and use that power in a variety of ways to improve housing conditions. Um, and we oftentimes partner with them, and if it needs to be a class action case, we will do that, or we'll intervene on behalf of a tenant association. We use community organizers as part of that network to demand um, an improvement to housing conditions and to get the local government to also enforce their code against the landlord. So it happens. I think it's absolutely not happening enough. Um, and so we try to push out um, a model and teach other legal aid programs um, to really talk about strategically doing stuff, right? 
picking your worst offender, your biggest landlord, going after them, getting your local government, if possible, on board to use code enforcement to the benefit of the tenants. In Chicago, we will encourage the city uh, uh, corporation counsel's office to file a housing court case against the bad owner. And then we will intervene in the case on behalf of uh, the tenant association to make sure that the housing is also preserved as it is improved. And where it really works is where then it's turned over to a preservation buyer. Um, we've also pushed out policies that will hold owners accountable when they fail to maintain their units. At Chicago, San Francisco, New York have really strong laws in terms of um, tenants having their independent ability to enforce housing conditions, to withhold rent. Um, but it's most effective if it's an organized effort in some way. It doesn't have to be a class action. And that's why I think the local uh, legal service programs can do it. But uh, New York has some of the best models. I, I'll just tell Chicago. I think Chicago has great models, and San Francisco does as well. Yeah, I will say, I mean, I think it is, I think it's a great story. And I think that, frankly, I think doing a, a story or a series of stories on housing court yeah. would be fascinating. Yeah. And I think this is true for all of you. I mean, right now in New York, right, we have now, we're going to have, in, an, in I think with six months or nine months, right, we're going to have supposedly universal representation for almost mm. universal oh, representation right. for, right. for tenants. Um, and I mean, right now, I don't know if you've now spent some time in housing court, but it's, yeah, it's, well, yeah, fascinating, right, is a good, I'm sorry. A good way to put so it. So we actually but, trot our yeah. interns through housing court yeah. so that, like, when they're seeing kind of, the, it's part of a kind of advocacy rotation yeah. that we put them through. Because, yeah, it is mind-boggling to them how oftentimes the, the landlord has a lawyer, the tenants do not. Yeah. And right. it, then that is an unequal access. Right. To, in to most it. jurisdictions, it's well over 90% of the tenants. And it's are not yeah. represented. Yeah. Are and it matters. Right. And I will say there was it really matters. good research right. uh, here in Boston and Washington that actually having, and this is randomized control, that actually having a lawyer makes a difference and, and reduces the chance of eviction. Um, and so, I mean, I think this is, and, and I also would just say to put it in sort of in a broader context, we've been talking a lot about housing, um, mm -hmm. subsidized housing programs, which is really important. But um, the majority of low-income households in this country live in privately owned, unsubsidized market-rate housing. And those are the families that are at most risk yeah. of eviction. I mean, Matt Desmond's mm. work you know, has beautifully sort of pointed yeah. this out. But I still feel like you know, we've gone through most of this day focusing on the 25% of Instead of, of the three out of four that four need it, that, right? That, that yeah. don't have it. And, yeah. and, and so I think that sort of, um, I do think that sort of for all of you, I think highlighting sort of the plight of the, the low-income families, I mean, the low-income children who mm -hmm. are, you know, trying to, to and, and it's, you know, these affordability pressures are stronger in the Bostons and the, you know, New Yorks and the LAs. And, but, but these are, um, these uh, are, this is a, you know, Rents are growing across the country right now, and have been for um, the last really, I mean, right, you know, yeah. decade and a half. But it doesn't mean housing conditions are improving, and that's the yeah. In some markets, it does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it, well, I have to say, I mean, I would, I would take some issue in how, like, in aggregate, housing conditions are improving, but they're not improving for everybody. So yeah. if you look at sort of measures of our sort yeah. of typical standard measures of housing quality, they they have gone up. Yeah. dramatically in the last several decades, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, and we might not be measuring the right thing. To yeah, I was going to say, I mean, yeah. I think it's like, um, I, I think there are some nice stories around, um, as what Kate alluded to, right, where you you find a pattern of a landlord disinvesting, right. um, and then you go to court, and then uh, there are really great affordable housing entities out there, like POA or community builders or others, that then will buy the unit and then Put investments in there. Um, there's an example from Cincinnati where they, they right. um, families kept coming to the children's hospital asking for letters to prevent evictions, and then they realized they were coming from the same landlord, right? And so it was a medical legal partnership story where they, um, by partnering the legal services entity at the local children's hospital, they were able to uncover it, and then legal services got the landlord to be changed, and then they were able to swoop in. But I do think that you're right to focus on this idea of, of unequal access in terms of getting that, that quality home. And then we just want you then, and then you're right, focusing on the solutions, the system side of it, 
and then the solution side of it because um, we would want more availability to affordable housing to come in and take over for those landlords um, and basically force them to sell if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Well, let's cheap let's judge, grab a couple sorry. more because otherwise we're going to... Okay. The chief judge of the New York Housing Court now is she is she's very interested in reform she and I thought she'd be happy to talk to you. Love to interview you. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave, head up for a bit. Uh, um, my name's Kristen. I'm a reporter for City Lab in Washington, D.C. Um, I know that the, uh, the penalty for repeat hospital users under ACA has led to some direct investment in housing, housing first, yep. uh, SROs in Los mm -hmm. Angeles out of the um, Department of Health yeah. uh, budget. Um, I wonder if that's been re uh, replicated in other places. Um, what uh, what the fate of this uh, penalty is under the new health care, and whether the discussion of health care repeal and the election has kind of curbed or changed the potential of, of these these housing first health uh, collaborations. Yeah, so that's great. So um, just to unpack that a little bit, so there is right now under Medicare a readmission penalty where if you have people come back within a certain amount of days after being discharged, a certain percentage of that happens, you may actually get a lower reimbursement. So it's a stick approach, right? Like we're gonna punish you because you haven't done that. And so it is true that there have been um, some thought about ways in which to shift dollars to think about that, that housing. The um, LA example is interesting. That's a Medicaid solution where they took savings from Medicaid and put it into a flexible fund um, Mitch Katz, who kind of came in under the, um, the human services, uh, was able to, to argue to the state that, listen, we have these savings. Let's now use these as flexible funds moving forward. Um, the feds were a little bit chagrined at that, but, but the state argued, nope, this is the right thing to do. And, and they have shown really good results in terms of further bending the cost curve. Um, I do think that... Um, uh, one of the things that's being talked about in the ACA is this flexibility. We're going to give states flexibility to do things better. I think flexibility is great, but you still need the dollars to be flexible or else you're just putting handcuffs on the system. And so it's interesting. Massachusetts is um, about to embark on our Medicaid, what are called ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations, which is where we get a kind of lump sum of money. And if we do a good job of managing under that lump sum of money, we will actually um, save money. So that's the carrot approach, right? You're rewarding me for doing a better job of, of doing things. Um, there are examples. Oregon um, has been doing coordinated care organizations, kind of a, another iteration of accountable care organizations. They have been actually successful, and they have been doing some investing in affordable housing from the healthcare sector to do that. We in Massachusetts were in, wrote in our waiver housing instability as one of the things that we could cover and be able to think about. And so thinking about it more from a services perspective, but also could be used, construed to be thinking about temporary housing and things like that. So this is where I feel like there's kind of a launching pad story that there's some really innovative stuff that have shown housing as a, um, as a kind of a medical intervention to bend the cost curve. But we can't like pull back those resources and expect the ability to continue to do that. I say it's like kind of we need to stock a housing pharmacy. We need to innovate in a lot of different ways and as a way to, to widen the array of different interventions. Housing first is one example, but we need innovation one step before housing first, right? Before people become the one percenters, we need to kind of think about ways to do that. And then I think that um, uh, as a pediatrician, I worry a lot about the kind of, um, the, there's a famous quote by Frederick Douglass, right? It's easier to build strong children than to fix broken men. And what ends up happening right now is if you focus just on a cost argument, like the only reason that healthcare could invest into housing is you need to bend the cost curve, you will continue to fix broken men instead of investing in strong children. And there's a lot of evidence around kind of almost Medicaid can then therefore be a life course kind of, inter, uh, kind of uh, uh, insurer. And so I do want us to always focus on cost because I actually think there's really compelling evidence about really aligning investments to be synergistic to have it. But I also want to talk about quality and just this being about a, a better quality of life for people and putting them on a better life course and thinking about this as kind of um, uh, ways in which we can um, uh, give people, everyone, the opportunity to be healthy. And so I want to try and think about both sides of that argument. Yes, right. 
Um, okay, say well, where you're from. I'm from, there. sorry, I'm from Chicago. I, I'm an education reporter at WBEZ. My name's Becky. Um, and I, my question has to do with um, how school choice um, can impact or I guess stymie some of the work around community building and mixed income developments. Um, I've covered a lot of scenarios where you know, neighborhoods have changed or been been engineered to be mixed income, yet the schools remain high poverty and um, majority students of color. And um, I guess my, my big question, in the same way that like it seems like there's a lot of talk about getting more people to opportunity zones, families all kind of chase the top schools and they leave the neighborhood schools or they'll leave the local schools, um, many of which need mixed income people in them. Um, and, and so I guess I'm, I'm just curious if you can give me examples of places where they've successfully done that without pushing out all the low income kids mm -hmm. or um, what you see as sort of <coughs> ways in which housing, housing authorities should be working or can be working with school districts because ours, don't, ours if, don't work together. If Boston is a place, I mean, I've watched that here where 20 years ago it was total white flight and now we've got both our kids in public schools in Boston and there's a huge mix and a lot of diversity and that's not to say that one school doesn't get taken over by the super aggressive white upper middle class parents. But by and large, it's a pretty, it's, there's a lot changing, you know, but I don't know, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, um, and there's no sort of easy answer to this. I, I will say it, it is true that we have um, we have sort of made more progress on um, sort of integrating our neighborhoods than we have integrating our schools. It's a, it's a, it's a, but um, that being said, if you sort of look over time, you can see that um, you know as neighborhoods become integrated and and if they sort of stay stably integrated and people feel comfortable. Um, that the schools do seem to be following um, mm -hmm. to some degree. It's sort of, they're, they're, they lag, um, but, um, but... That's a tricky thing. I mean, usually it's moving thing. in a direction. Yeah, it's, like yeah it's, a, it's a tricky thing. And in some ways, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, th I think there's a, there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of interesting, we talked about this yesterday, a lot of interesting stories now. Can you to cover? Yeah. districts and housing yeah. authorities are working together <laughs> well because I, yeah. I think often it's they will follow if some new residents take the chance and do their moral thing and move yeah. into the school yeah. and yeah. I just think that's a really bad thing to yeah. like lean on <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so actually Yana probably I know um, has some examples sure I mean there are um, in, in King County um, in uh, in Washington, that's um, a housing authority that has been very involved in sort of building partnerships with mm -hmm. the local schools. I, I would hold them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are other I know, um, and I'm and I'm happy to sort of connect you with some other some other folks. But and, and Yana, did you want to yeah, add? Yeah, um, yeah. There's several housing authorities in the Northwest with support from the yeah. Gates Foundation who yes. are working with the school systems there. And actually, yeah. one of the resources that's linked to in the resources for the um, for today's uh, workshop is about a Tacoma Housing Authority collaboration um, with the school, the local schools, and in particular um, elementary school, Harbor <coughs> Elementary, and the Urban Institute, Erica and her team, put together this piece sort of chronicling that story. So there's some good mm -hmm. examples there. There's also now um, a community of practice that's been, um, that the Council of Large Public Housing Authorities is working on to get large public housing authorities in more direct conversation and collaboration with um, large school districts. Um, and they're looking at a variety of fronts. How, how do we share data that came up earlier? Um, so you know who are the kids that are serving that are both in public housing and attending the schools. And if there are absentee issues, how do you address those things? After school programs, how do you integrate those into the housing developments using the physical plant of the housing as a platform to bring in those services? So there's some some examples. So that that's one that I would it's a deep yeah. example with a lot of. Um, and there's some wonderful community groups that yeah. I'm happy to, to point you to that are um, really um, working with um, 
you know, kids living in uh, public housing and, and uh, helping to provide them with, um, you know, supplementary services and after school that um, are really doing a terrific job. Yeah, well. I think in some ways, like, I, I kind of um, like the term community development because it kind of mirrors child development in the sense of, like, sometimes you're crawling, sometimes you're walking, sometimes you're running. And for certain communities, there's the example of, like, say you tear down the public housing, you bring in a Hope Six. A lot of those programs included a school on site that was supposed to be kind of willing, but they were starting from, like, the crawling stage. So the expectation that you're going to go from crawling to running, I think, sets us up. So I think it's really important in the, the narratives is to kind of get the right ready, like, where's the community at right, so that you're not setting up the story so that it's, like, it, it's expected to fail because you've set up an expectation that this is the benchmark of success. But I do think there are more and more of um, kind of as neighbors gentrify, are there ways in which you can maintain the public housing and maintain the use of the actual schools? And there are examples in Boston, Jamaica Plain, and others where that has seemed to have happened. But it's, again, the arc of change can feel pretty long. And just to follow up on that, I think that that's a super interesting idea. You know, a lot of there's sort of a trend around the country right now in housing, right, is you've got younger people moving back to the cities and reclaiming the urban core. You mentioned Jamaica Plain, that's where I happen to live, and I'm seeing it there. You know, and, and as a lot of gentrification happens, like, you know, what are some really important policies, partly what you just said, but for us to be reporting on, so it's not just like, okay, all of the those folks who were on Section 8 or whatever just get pushed out, you know, so that, that the zoning boards and the redevelopment authorities could be passing laws that say, okay, look, this community's doing a lot better, but let's keep some of the folks here who've been here for, you know, what, what are the ways, because it's very hard to fight the market, right? If prices go up, what can you do? What, what are things besides like, you know, rent control, which is, it's, you know, in some places it exists, most places it doesn't. What are some cool innovative things you're seeing to, to make that work? Or? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I think that there are, first of all, I would just sort of make a distinction between the kind of, uh, Policies that focus on really protecting people who are currently in place in a community. You know, maybe like, not that's often those the particular focus, right? people, but right, but, but just that's so often you what the focus keep is, the mix, right? you know, right? And yeah. but but I agree with you that I feel like often that's where the debate is, and that's sort of like you're fighting the battle, but you're losing the war meanwhile because you know right. the neighborhoods change because of the composition of the people who are moving in, and so I think you really have to. I don't think that there is any substitute for sort of place-based subsidized uh, yeah. de designated affordable yeah. housing in those communities. You and, just and tell developers if done. you're going to build the ritzy stuff, you also have yeah, to build Yeah, so the right, stuff. through inclusionary zoning, through, um, you know, the preserving the assisted housing that's there. I mean, uh, I keep on referencing New York, but but looking in New York, I think this is this is true in many cities around the country. I mean, we found that 12% of the... Of the um, rental housing stock, which is most of the housing stock in gentrifying neighborhoods in New York, is public housing. Another 25% is publicly owned subsidized housing. And so you've got a lot of sort of, I mean, that public housing hopefully is permanently affordable. Mm. The, um, you know, the privately owned subsidized housing, at least it's sort of, it's locking in affordability for a while and has the potential to, you know, to, to renegotiate and preserve those, mm -hmm. those buildings as well. So I think that that's, that's really critical. I mean, there are a lot of other yeah, I will just bring up, so um, we haven't talked a lot about renter households, right? We've talked about already subsidized households, but again, there are 11 million households that are spending 50% or more of their income, and oftentimes they may be making that as a choice to get an access to a school, right? So the idea that that we, um, that there's kind of this one-size-fits-all thing, and I my hope is, I, I, I am the eternal op optimist, we're not, a, we're going to make the glass bigger, I liked that last one, yeah, right? We're going to make the glass good. bigger, is... Um, is it would be great to think about ways in which to help support people to move into neighborhoods they want to if they're trying to use that as a way to unlock a school. So like a renter's tax credit, um, Barbara Sard at the Center for Budget Policy Priority came up with a really great one. Um, uh, Carol Galante at the Turner Center at Berkeley came up with another version. I think there are interesting ways in which to help people who are not in subsidized housing yet, but just need a little bit of help to make the rent so it's less of a burdensome trade-off. And that can be an interesting policy that may help a family stay in a neighborhood that they wouldn't otherwise be able to stay in or access a neighborhood they wouldn't be able to access. Hi, uh, Tanzina Vega, CNN. Um, I live in New York, and um, we get a lot of these affordable housing units built, the 20%. <laughs> But we need to be realistic about those units. I mean, many of those units are already zoned for certain 
uh, people in, within that community. And then within that, there are certain units that go for the el elderly or mm -hmm. veterans or what have you, yeah. or people making. So at the end of the day, I mean, we're not really talking about a lot of housing stock. And anybody that no lives in New York, I mean, we can talk about affordable housing all day. Tens of thousands of applications will go in for 10 units yeah. mm -hmm. within yeah. every so one of these buildings that's being built. Yeah. So I think we have to sort of reframe the, the conversation the too and like stop, you know, acting like we're building so much affordable mm -hmm. housing. Because mm -hmm. at least in New York, we're not. And it's not permanent. And it's not permanent. And this is like, I mean, there are people living in Mitchell Lamas right, right now. Actually, but, but they're a small, I mean, I totally agree. The, the one hand inclusionary zoning, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great policy tool, mm -hmm. but it's building this much. It's even in New York, much. even in New York with the housing plan, right? It's building this much, and we need those federal I can tell resources. You from experience, I've sent in, yeah. I don't know how many over the oh, yeah. years, and I, you never hear back. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's, oh, send in for the thousand, lottery. Yeah, it's right. A okay. to one yeah. Now. yeah, exactly. That's a hard thing, because if we talk a little bit about supply and demand, right? So, so um, to an extent, we, we do need to build more supply, but that takes time, right? And there are a lot, and we can try and push capital more into it to try and increase supply faster. So we, we clearly are not, the, the demand that we have, we are not keeping up with at all in our supply. So that is a story that's really important and it's important to tell it as the system that creates those disincentives and we need to change, these are the solutions to change the system. I also think the reason I brought up, say, the renter's tax credit is that it could be an off-the-shelf solution right away that could help people in the interim while we are trying to address the, the supply but if you just give people more money and you don't increase supply, you're going to end up eating into that because then the rents will just go higher, right? So it has to be balanced. So that's the other piece is I think oftentimes it's important to talk about the balance of policies to help both supply and demand and then all the stakeholders in that, right? So the schools are a great stakeholder. Healthcare is a great stakeholder. The jails are a great stakeholder, like, or the cr criminal justice system. Like, there are a lot of people that have a stake in us not having enough affordable housing or not helping people afford their homes, and we don't ever talk about all those stakeholders. Okay, I have a quick question. Doing exactly what you guys said not to do, which is putting two maps on top of one another. <laughs> These are two maps that recently came out in Boston. Uh, one is about climate change in the future and yeah. where we'll be. Where are we going to put our new neighborhoods? And where, exactly, where are we going to put our new uh, neighborhoods, including affordable housing? Yeah. Um, and I kind of, it reminded me of what was happening in East Chicago right. and also probably with huge health yeah. consequences if there is massive change. And I just want to know what's being done about this. And what's happening in other cities, is this a problem that's widespread? I haven't looked into it hugely, but... Yeah, so I will say, let me just say one thing. I mean, it is, we just actually, if, if we didn't, we're, I think next week we're going to release a, a tool at the Furman Center website that basically maps out all the multifamily housing in, um, the, in the flood zone, in the 100-year flood zone around the country. And it is all it's over lot. the place. It's, it's just... all over the place. Okay. And so, and we tend to, one of the things that, I don't think we have great solutions right now, but... Um, our model of sort of, of, um, of disaster relief and, and, and resiliency is basically, you know, putting single family homes up on stilts, right? You can't do that with a multifamily apartment building, right? And, and you also can't, and it's, and it's also, it's really expensive um, to actually, uh, you know, to retrofit these buildings, to make them resilient to, mm -hmm. to floods. And, um, and that is really difficult. And when you've got an af affordable, particularly subsidized housing, there are all sorts of federal regulations. I mean, it's very complicated. But um, so I think this is a huge challenge, and those are two maps you should put on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. We do. <laughs> no, I, I think it's right. So I actually asked the Boston Planning and Development Authority that very question. I think. Their feeling is, is there aren't that many options for where to put new neighborhoods. Yeah. And so in a limited option yeah. zone, then that makes sense to do it. And then they argue they'll do like what they did in the seaport where they'll build up as a way to make it a floodable building. It, I think it's hard. I feel like um, uh, in medicine, again, we talk about the unintended consequence, the side effect of the treatment and what's an acceptable level of side effect and what's not an acceptable level of side effect. And so I do feel like there are... Um, as we think about this concept of resiliency, right, you're making a building more resilient to a threat, right, and you're hopefully um, not just focusing on the building but on the people, right, side of things so that the people are resilient. And I think that, that there are adaptations, you know, we have to change our climate, 
um, change kind of trajectory. But in the meantime, we do need to think about retrofitting and, and other things. But yeah, I think it is a really important thing to question about what's our resiliency efforts, where are those focused, and are they focused in communities of color that are low income? And that is where there typically is the biggest gap, and that it has to be both a um, what they learned for Katrina was that it's as much a, a people problem as it was a systems problem because people didn't know their neighbors, they didn't check on people, they didn't make sure that people got out and things like that. And so RAND has actually focused a lot on their resiliency efforts being more people-based than necessarily infrastructure-based. We have time for one or two more, two, uh, sorry, 250 is when we're supposed to wrap up? Sorry, okay, uh, go ahead. So um, I have a question uh, in regards to um, it just seems as though it's a lot of the responsibilities for housing are being downloaded onto local leaders. Um, and there pretty much aren't any cities in the country that can probably um, drop together the resources needed to build a lot of new affordable housing. Um, so what are some policies that could potentially be pursued um, to, you know, <coughs> I mean, there's the idea of ensuring that all the um, renters in eviction court have lawyers, and that would obviously do a lot. Um, or something in my city, we've been, a lot of people have like been wanting to do something where you fix up the houses that already exist that are cheap, and in poor neighborhoods where people are living, but there's lead paint and all this other stuff, and, um, but, the politicians oftentimes don't seem to be as excited about those so you don't get to go to, you know, the ceremonies where you cut the ribbon and like all that kind of stuff. So yeah, are there any kind of hopeful models that you guys know of uh, where people aren't just I will say it? that there are cities now across the country that um, that are increasingly, you're seeing sort of an, 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 a, a really pretty notable increase in the number of local housing plans that are being released. And and I think that the answer is that you've just, you kind of got to, you got to take the whole toolkit. And it's not just about spending local tax dollars. There is, that, that may be important, but you've got state resources. Hopefully you have some federal resources. Um, and you've got land use. Right, which is something that um, is really important. Um, you've got whether that's through you know um, making sure that you, you know increasing density and and, uh, and instituting inclusionary zoning. You've got property tax policy that can use um, can be an incentive. You've got um, housing court, as you said. You've got housing codes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really it's it's a, I think local governments really have to think sort of systematic sort of develop a a comprehensive kind of local housing strategy mm -hmm. and really try to think about how to put all of these tools together. And are there any that you can name, like, in particular, that have been doing that? Yeah, so I'm um, Seattle, Boston. I know at the Joint Center, right, the mayor of Boston is coming on Monday to talk about um, his new housing plan. Um, I keep on saying New York, but New York. Yeah. New York's been doing this for a while. Um, I do you think the number yeah. of housing ballot initiatives that are in yeah. local areas, Denver, LA, other yeah, cities, Denver's where they're, another one that's where they're, they're putting, plan. yeah, I mean, Denver did an enormous transit oriented development, you know, they put up town transit and now put aside specific um, funds to buy land for affordable housing to make it transit oriented development. And so what's interesting <laughs> is when you talk to any mayor across the country, housing is like their top thing they're talking about. Yeah. And then if you talk to the representatives that are actually doing that, they've never heard of housing. No one's ever brought it up to them on a, on a visit. That's what I'm, I, I always am a little mystified at that disconnect. And so I wonder at some point when it will, where the federal government will feel like, it's not that they're the only ones that are going to solve it. This is ultimately a local problem. But this is where every mayor is thinking about this every day. And yet there are really important federal tools that, that need to come down to enable the locals to do their thing. And that's where the federal government essentially gets out of the housing business, which is kind of unfortunately my worry in some of the current situations, that, that will have huge implications on the city and state. And that's where I think this, like um, again, the system coverage story of how they're kind of the federal government and locals are partnering, need to partner together in order to do this, I think is a really important part of the story. Well, I think time-wise, we should stop there and thank Kate and Megan and Ingrid for doing this. And hopefully, you guys can share your yeah, contact. Uh, contact.